Hi everybody and welcome to another piano video here at Miriam Pianos. My name is Stu Harrison and in this video we're talking about baby grand pianos. This is a, a follow-up video where I'm really going to be focusing on what are the questions you need to ask yourself to uh, dive into this whole shopping process and have this experience be a positive one and not get bogged down and lost uh, trying to navigate all of these forums uh, and understanding exactly what's important. So we're gonna try and simplify that a little bit in today's video and boil this down into a few simple questions that is gonna accelerate your shopping process and hopefully make it a little bit more enjoyable. So let's get started with this right away. Thanks so much for joining us. So let's get started. Uh, first thing I want to say is the point of this video is not to tell you what model to buy or what brand to buy or how much money to spend. The purpose of the video is to help you navigate your shopping process so that you know what uh, questions you should be asking uh, and you're just better informed when you uh, start to either walk into some showrooms or start to dive into websites. You have some type of a framework to understand how you could be making this decision. Uh, and the first piece of feedback I'd give on that front is do not start with brand. A lot of people enter this shopping process uh, knowing not very much about baby grand pianos, but they probably have heard about a brand and that's generally where they start their shopping process. It's no different than how we start shopping for televisions, computers, cars. You know, we've heard a friend say something good about a particular brand. We've seen it on the street. We've seen it in the living rooms like, oh, wow, yeah, that must be a really great option. And without totally understanding how the industry is structured or how much money you need to spend in order to get a certain quality point, we dive right into the ecosystem at the brand point and we deprive ourselves of a lot of really valuable information and in understanding exactly where we want to be in the overall structure of the industry. So my first point, point of advice is don't start with brand. There are four or five other questions that I would strongly suggest you do start with. And the first one I'm gonna say is decide on how big an instrument you can actually fit in your home. We've used the label Baby Grand in the title of the video, and that's a really loose term. I mean, Baby Grand, uh, in terms of the industry, we call anything from about a four foot nine to about a five foot three a Baby Grand. And when I'm talking about length, really, just so that we're clear, we're talking about the distance between uh, here on the piano back to about the back edge or the back curve of the instrument. And that's how we measure grand pianos. And so when people in the business say baby grand, we're talking about anything that's about four foot nine to five foot three. But people who are just shopping for an instrument, even sometimes pianists themselves, usually use the term baby grand piano interchangeably with just grand piano which we think of as anything from about five foot up to six and a half, even seven feet in length. And that's when we start to get into semi-concert grands or grand pianos. So the information we're gonna be giving to you in, the, uh, in this video is applicable pretty much to any size of piano. Um, but of course, if you are looking for a baby grand, which is sort of something in and around that five foot range, it's going to be, uh, you know, extra helpful, hopefully. So as I said, a really great place to start is actually deciding what size of instrument you think you can accommodate. Because you can get a five foot piano used for probably $5,000. You could get a brand new five foot piano that costs $100,000. And so the size and the budget really are quite disconnected. So deciding what you can fit will then allow you to continue moving through the different questions, which will hopefully let you start to hone in on your perfect solution. Um, you can get templates often from websites or dealers that'll help you decide uh, what size you need. Uh, as we said, there are lots of places where you can get free or very inexpensive templates so you can understand um, how much floor space you need for a particular size. But there's another really important consideration, which is the bass string length. Now, when we're talking about bass string, um, bass strings are, of course, the lower strings, uh, which are copper in color. Uh, so we're talking about these fatter bass strings down here. 
Uh, and these strings, even though it's not intuitive uh, to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, look at this fact, the shorter the string, the fatter they actually have to make the string. Um, because you're basically substituting uh, length um, with thickness so that the string still has approximately the same mass. And that's how uh, you wind up being able to generate the same frequency. But the shorter the string and the more they have to wrap it with copper, the more there's a chance that the, all that extra copper winding is going to create a lot of additional frequencies. They call it overtones or uncontrolled overtones. And you're hearing more of those overtones, which are kind of like extra color tones on top, than you are of the actual string itself. And so sometimes you'll hear people refer to that as clarity uh, or lack of clarity, uh, or whether you know a bass string is really kind of uh, noisy or, or uh, you know not producing a nice clean tone. So the shorter the piano, the shorter the bass string, and the shorter the bass string, the very good chance that you're going to wind up with this lack of clarity. You start to see that change right around the 5 foot 2, 5 foot 3 mark. And so I would say uh, for people who are more serious players or they've already had some experience with pianos before, if you can fit, uh, you know, a five foot one, five foot two, and you're like, oh, you know, there's just no way that you can get any bigger than that. Fair enough. Uh, you know, you're you, you can find other ways to make sure that the piano you get is going to be really satisfying. But if there's an extra way to just push that a little bit and make sure that you're kind of in that five two, five three uh, range, which is going to be in around 100. And, 55, 156 centimeters or above, there's some extra tonal benefits that you get from that. Uh, second question after size that I'd suggest uh, considering is exactly what uh, quality or price range you think you might want to be in. As I said right at the beginning, you can get a five foot piano that costs $5,000 or $100,000. So kind of figuring out where you think you should be or, or uh, what level of investment is appropriate for you uh, I would say is the next most important thing. Uh, and when we talk about quality, like why is you know this piano one price? Why are those pianos over there another price? What makes any of these instruments so much different than one another that the price point would be that uh, wide? Well, I'm just going to walk over here and talk a little bit about why those price ranges are as wide as they are. Now, these are two displays from Bechstein, and you will see that I reference some brands. This is not to say that these are the brands that you should be buying. They happen to be the brands that we uh, carry here at the store. Uh, but there's several more that I will be uh, suggesting and, and that we might be referencing. Um, but if you're wondering why you're seeing these particular brands, well, we are a piano store, and these are the ones that we happen to sell. So these two diagrams that we're looking at are really good examples of what two different quality ranges will give you when you're kind of under the hood of the piano. Because when you're looking at them from the exterior, they kind of do look the same. You've got this black or often black shiny exterior, and they all have steel plates and they all have the copper strings and they kind of look the same and you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe the only difference in price really is brand. Maybe the brand is what's creating this, uh, this extra layer of cost. Well, in pianos, maybe more than any other high-end good, uh, for, for the most part, for the large part of the industry, you're getting what you pay for. If you're spending $100,000 on a piano, there's a very good chance it's not just the brand you're paying for, it's because that instrument has uh, you know, two or three times more cost involved in the instrument. Uh, the cost of the materials is there, the cost of the labor is a whole lot higher. Uh, the piano industry is not an industry where a lot of people are getting super rich and super wealthy, and the margins are actually fairly tight. So when you have a price point that's getting up into the six digits, it usually means that you're, as I said, getting what you pay for. Um, I'm not going to uh, drill too much into the weeds here, but I'm going to give you an example of why two different price ranges might result in two different uh, you know, quality levels. So on the left, we have a diagram of what approximately a 50,000 US dollar uh, grand piano would get you in terms of certain components, and I'll point those out. And on the right, we've got an instrument that is basically twice the price. So they're both from Bechstein. They're both made in Germany. So why would one piano be $100,000 US 
why would another piano be $50,000 US? And by looking at these two, you start to understand why really the entire industry has these types of price differentials. Uh, grand pianos can be broken down into about four different components. You've got action, you've got the rim, you've got uh, the soundboard, and then you've got sort of this, the uh, scaling uh, and the harmonic components. Um, and when you start to take a peek at the differences of that, you realize what a massive difference in production time and just the tolerances and the quality of materials can exist. Let's take a look first at the rim. So here's an example of a $50,000 piano, and we have the outer rim and the inner rim. Um, I should point out that most pianos all have an outer or an inner rim, with a couple of exceptions. Steinway is well known for having their continuously bent rim, meaning the outer and the inner rim are actually formed at the same time. Um, there is some debate as to whether that actually results in any sort of a musical advantage, um, however, it is something that they have done right from the beginning of their uh, time in the industry and they use hard rock maple for that. So uh, certainly just the longevity of, of the design and the success of the design you know, speaks to that. However, um, most pianos have an outer and an inner, inner rim. And with the lower uh, cost Bechstein, you can see that there are far more laminations and that those laminations have more imperfections and it's a lower quality of hardwood uh, that's going into those laminations. So you're taking a lower grade wood and you're essentially substituting the quality of the wood for uh, you know, a laminating process uh, that kind of compensates for that. So you probably have uh, 30 or 40 laminations through here, uh, which means more glue uh, it may mean uh, more stability in the structure, however, that rim is going to produce less of a tonal effect, less of a, um, uh, you know, a speaking effect than a rim that has higher quality uh, fiber, less wood, and is just able to resonate more. So we've seen that. Now if we go over here and take a look at what a $100,000 rim looks like, you can see there's actually quite a big difference. Far fewer laminations, a greater variety of hardwoods that have been selected there with all sorts of different pore lengths so that different frequencies can respond. Uh, and of course, uh, the tolerances by which those laminations uh, are, are created and sanded and manufactured are extremely high. There's just literally not a thousandth of an inch gap in between any one of those laminations. And so as you go uh, down from this type of a concept, all the way down to say a five or a $10,000 piano, you basically continue to get a cheapening of the materials, a thinning of the rim, and more glue and more uh, laminating, uh, taking the place of thicker laminations, higher quality wood, where the wood itself can do uh, quite a bit of the tonal generation of the piano. Um, so there's just one example uh, in a piano where a very different design, a different use of material, and a different set of tolerances actually produce both a, a, a different musical effect as well as uh, quite a desperate um, pricing effect as well. And you see that as you go all the way through the piano. You get the same type of effect when you get to a soundboard, where a soundboard uh, that uses a slow growth spruce versus one that's grown at lower altitudes and has thicker rings um, makes quite a big difference in terms of the responsiveness of the soundboard. Um, you get a big difference when the soundboard is tapered, such as you see here. It sort of becomes uh, narrower when you get to the outside and thicker when it's on the inside versus this one, uh, which is actually a uniform thickness all the way through. So that's a, another difference that you see on instruments as you go from a lower price point to a higher price point you see differences in how well the overall frame of the instrument is integrated um, and cohesive so that energy uh, that's received at any one point of the rim is able to be reflected through the entire structure. Uh, you see steel plating often in higher quality instruments versus ones where it's basically left up uh, to the carpentry to ensure that you get all of that reflection and all of that uh, connectiveness. So these are the questions that may help you to determine what price range you want to be in. 
because all of this results in clarity and consistency of tone. Um, action is another really, really big one, which has more to do with the feel of the piano than it does the sound of the piano. But those two things together are going to produce either the $10,000 piano or the $100,000 piano. So if you are new to piano, and this is something that is you're just really passionate, really excited about, and you think that having a beautiful instrument in your home is gonna inspire you to sit there and wanna make music, uh, and you don't really have too many reference points, um, and you're not, uh, say, a, you know, an avid audiophile, a $10,000 piano may totally satisfy that need for you. If you've already got some experience with instruments and you're moving from an upright to a grand uh, or your ear is developed and the $10,000 piano is going to have too many inconsistencies in the tone or it's not going to have the resonance out of the body uh, that's going to cause you to want to sit there and be uh, you know, moved to, to play for hours, then maybe twenty dollars or $30,000 is what you are going to want to invest in to get an instrument that's you know, very consistent um, and uh, is your, you know, your ears aren't going to be picking up on imperfections. Um, clear of the $30,000 mark is where you might get somebody who's truly uh, either a higher level player or uh, you know, a passionate audiophile who isn't just looking for a lack of uh, imperfections, which is what you kind of get when you get up to around the $30,000 range, but beyond that, then it starts to become more of a connoisseur's uh, art. You know, the difference between buying a bottle of wine for under 20 bucks versus spending $200 on a bottle of wine. It really becomes how focused towards a very specific tone and a very specific touch uh, do you want to get. Um, so price is the second question that I would say you really, really want to make sure that you can uh, spend some time thinking about. This is where getting into showrooms and sitting down and playing a number of price points without being you know, too scared that you're going to fall in love with something. Uh, but that'll help you educate yourself in terms of what your ear uh, really needs. As my advice to every customer is always, if you can hear the difference, it may be worth it for you. If you can't hear the difference, there's a good chance it's not a good investment for you. Uh, and I think that holds true for many, many people who are shopping for this. If you can discern it uh, and you can afford it, then it may be a really good spend. And if not, uh, just find that point where you're not able to discern anymore. Uh, and there's a good chance that that's probably where um, you know, a logical spend for you would be. So we've talked about rim, we've talked about soundboard. Action is another really big factor which contributes to your overall enjoyment as well as the price. And here is why this is such a big impact on the price of an instrument. It's often said that on a digital piano, more than half the cost of the piano uh, is the action on its own. And on a grand piano, it's not quite half, but you're definitely looking at 20, 30% of the cost of the instrument is wrapped up in either the construction or the preparation of the action. And here's why. There is an enormous number of parts that go into a grand piano. Uh, and so just the sheer complexity of how this action is built, assembled, and designed on its own would certainly add a, an incredible amount of cost to the instrument. Uh, and different manufacturers will have many different approaches uh, to how they design it, how they build it, how they prepare it, uh, and how well it lasts out in the field. You know, whether you're using a laminated key stick or a solid wood key stick, um, you know, the length of the key, the geometry involved, whether it's using composite parts or whether it's using all wood parts, whether the hammer is a single felted or a double felted, whether the shank is a particular type of wood and how well uh, you know, it's balanced. And you have different levels of fanaticism as you go through uh, all of the different price ranges. And for every one of these parts, you can get into essays on whether one particular design versus another particular design is the most advantageous route to go. Uh, and so basic designs that don't receive a lot of time and regulation to refine them and don't really uh, try and push the envelope in terms of innovation are not very expensive. And a lot of Chinese manufacturers uh, will supply you an action like that for $800, $1,000 as a manufacturer. It's not a big deal. 
um, but you're not going to get a very stable action or a very consistent action or one capable of translating a lot of nuance. Um, as you go through uh, the various price ranges, um, the biggest difference tends to be um, the time that they take to regulate the, the action, meaning how much time they're spending to adjust every single one of these tiny little components so that it's operating perfectly. Uh, and then the second big one is materials. Um, the cost difference between a basic hammer and a really premium hammer that's you know got nice uh, felt on it, double felted, uh, the time that they take to choose uh, the shank of the hammer, how well uh, you know the damper felt is regulated, it gets insane uh, to the point where some manufacturers are spending 40 or 50 hours regulating uh, an action. And those are being done by artisans which are being paid you know, 40, 50, 60 dollars uh, per hour as well. And so even before you get into the cost of materials, you're already looking at several thousand dollars at the manufacturing level uh, to get this action arriving in a showroom absolutely perfect. So uh, huge range in cost, materials and design uh, in actions. And for somebody who's a more advanced player, this is gonna be one of the most critical uh, points, critical decisions uh, that you are gonna make. Now, the fourth aspect that I really want to highlight uh, are some of the internal uh, scaling components uh, of the instrument. I'm just going to walk over here. This is a Kawhi GL10. This is their um, entry point baby grand piano. It's five foot one uh, in length. And I'm going to draw your attention to this area right here. And you'll notice that the strings, uh, which are coming across the bridge right here, um, are then wrapped around these pins and this whole section is muted. These strings are being pressed up against this piece of felt, and it's just not possible for these strings to ring. Obviously, they are, um, you know, there's, there's no allowance uh, for them to, to be able to sympathetically resonate. Uh, and this is very common uh, for pianos that are kind of in and around 10, 15, even some $20,000 pianos um, have this type um, of stringing. Uh, as a part of their design, as part of the scaling. Um, however, when you look over at something like a GX, which is also part of the Kauai ecosystem, and you look at the same section, you see something quite a bit different. And this is what is called duplex scaling. Now, duplex scaling um, it does, uh, enables this other section to ring. So you notice that as I'm plucking this, you're actually hearing pitch instead of just a sort of a thunk uh, like you did the other way. Uh, now, the energy to get that string activated isn't crossing the bridge. This is actually just sympathetic resonance that's happening uh, from you know, energy that's just being transferred through the entire instrument. And all of that extra um, uh, sort of frequencies and extra color uh, thicken uh, the treble. And so this is something that adds a lot of very specific character to an instrument is what they do with that top end. You'll also see that on the front of the string there's another section which sometimes is called a double duplex and again you'll see on the Kawhi that this is actually uh, a very specific fulcrum here and here uh, and so these are also allowed to ring sympathetically. So those, how a manufacturer deals with those two sections, the front and the back duplex section, affects quite a bit of the tone of the instrument. And the very last part of piano design, which I'm gonna highlight, because it's, it's one of the most misunderstood or, or least talked about, it maybe is the best way to say it, it's actually the bridge. Now, we, you just saw two bridges because it was this piece of wood that's actually uh, kind of snaking along through the piano. And this is the piece of wood uh, whose responsibility uh, is to take the vibrations from the string and kind of squish it down into the soundboard. It, it translates or it, it, it uh, transfers the vibrations to the soundboard and that's actually uh, ultimately where the sound comes from. Um, but not many people know that bridges are one of the most complex little piece of carpentry in the whole piano. What we're looking at here is often thought of as kind of the top level design that you can get in a bridge. Uh, and they call this a vertically laminated capped bridge. And so 
you can see that there's a little piece of wood right on the top, uh, which is horizontal, and that's where uh, all of the bridge pins are, are tapped into. Uh, and that uh, really helps uh, to cushion the incredible tension and weight that's, that the uh, strings are pushing down on. Um, but then you've got all of these different types of wood which are vertically laminated. And the, and the purpose of that is that just like the piano rim, different types of wood have different pore lengths and different densities and they're better at communicating different frequencies. And so this bridge is really like a highway uh, for the frequencies to travel from the string down into the soundboard. And when it's only one piece of wood, or there's all kinds of glue in the middle of it, like a laminated bridge, lots of frequencies, lots of information actually gets omitted. And so the point of a bridge is to be basically um, not be there. You want the bridge uh, to be able to communicate a maximum amount of that tonal information that's contained within the string. Uh, and so the type of bridge out that you're getting on the instrument will have an influence in the price for sure, and definitely an influence on the color and the range of frequencies and harmonics that your piano is able to produce. And so there's a, a, a pretty wide variety of the type of bridges you can get. Uh, the most common is literally just a single piece of wood. There's no vertical lamination, there's no cap, it's just a single piece of wood that might be maple, it might be hornbeam. Uh, then you have a solid bridge with a cap, uh, is kind of the next one that you get up. Uh, then you might get uh, uh, some sort of a laminated vertical lamination uh, that's just a single piece or a single type of wood. Uh, and then finally at the very, very top, uh, so you have Homburg, Steinway, Bechstein, uh, Shigeru, uh, Kawai, and uh, Fazioli would probably be the four examples that come most uh, readily to mind for me, are bridges that actually have this type of configuration. So that kind of rounds off the discussion of specific components and why they can have such a huge influence, both on the musical experience as well as the price the manufacturers are charging for it. Third question that I would say you need to address is whether you're looking at new or whether you're looking at used. And this ties directly into question number two, which is what price am I looking at? Because sometimes these are highly related. Let's say you decide that you want to spend $20,000 on an instrument. And if that means a new piano, then you may be looking at a certain set of instruments. But as soon as you start looking at used, it opens up this whole other realm of instruments. And so you're thinking to yourself, well, how do I know what the better spend is? And unfortunately, there is no simple answer to that. And the reason is that pianos are not uh, static in terms of their design, in terms of the quality of the manufacturer. This industry is always evolving and always changing. And so, you know, if buying a piano in 1990 meant that you basically were getting the same instrument then, than you were if you went out and spent the same amount of money today. Like in other words, if the design was static and nothing else was different, this would be a very, very uh, confusing, uh, well, basically pian new pianos probably would never sell. Um, but the reality is that there are a lot of constant evolutionary forces acting upon the industry. And I'll just give you an example right here. Uh, this piano, which is a Kawai GX series, uh, is evolved uh, from really it's kind of a combination of both the Shigeru Kawai as well as the RX. And there's a bit of a debate amongst uh, people who know Kawai well and are involved in, in Kawai whether the GX really is an evolution up from the RX or whether it's a de-evolution down from the Shigeru. My vote is that it's actually kind of devolved from the Shigeru, but this is getting into a bit of an esoteric debate. The point is that this instrument uh, represents Kawai's mid-range offering, which they focus towards their institutional market or their better players uh, for home. And you know, different markets will have different specific price points for this, but it's a GX1. And so in US dollars, you're, you know, this piano is usually floating somewhere in the low to mid $20,000 range. Uh, for that price, you could probably find a seven foot version of uh, Kawai's um, RX or KG series. And how big is this one? Uh, this one is actually a five foot six. So it's a five foot six. This is still kind of considered a baby grand piano. 
Um, but if you were looking at a longer instrument, which was older, you'd probably be talking about the same price range. And so where's the better value? Well, here's some uh, advice when it comes to used instruments. So first of all, you have to investigate every single used piano on a very individual basis because there is no uniform way in which a, a, a used piano degrades over time. But this is the important thing to know. All used pianos do degrade over time. There are aspects of an acoustic piano in which, you know, it's just physics and time don't work in its favor. You have 30,000 pounds of tension um, that are operating on the frame of the piano. You have two or three tons of tension that's constantly pushing down on the soundboard of the piano. You have thousands of moving parts in the action which is basically just an engine, and over time, those parts also wind up wearing down. So there's no such thing as a used piano that's in the same physical condition as a, as a new piano if it has been used, even if it's been used really responsibly with regular uh, maintenance and follow-up and tuning and all of that. It just, it's like a car, uh, you know, pianos are not like violins that age gracefully and, and in fact could improve. Um, the main difference between a violin and a piano, violin has what, four or five moving parts uh, and there's only a couple hundred pounds of tension on a violin. You're talking about thousands of moving parts and tens of thousands of pounds of tension on this instrument. They just don't last forever. They all slowly degrade. So the trade-off with a used piano or the way that I would suggest thinking about a used piano is if clarity of bass tone and volume are priorities to you, then a used instrument, a used larger used grand, could make a lot of sense. If you're thinking in your head that really the only thing that you want to be doing is, uh, you know, trying to save some money, uh, and you're thinking that you're actually getting more for your money with a used one than you are with a new, that actually just doesn't tend to be true. Uh, if you buy a $20,000 piano used that's now $10,000, that's maybe 15 to 20 years old, and you measure that instrument against its new equivalent, here is what you're often going to find, is that the sustain is now nowhere close to what the new one is. So you're dealing with a lower level of sustain. You're dealing with an action which is going to have a lower repetition speed and probably more loose and less life left in the hammer. Uh, it will probably distort more than a new instrument because of the compression on the hammer and the aging of the string. It's not going to hold its tune as well. So you start to add all of these things up and you think to yourself, well, how much would I pay to make sure that the tuning was the same? Uh, maybe I'd add $1,000. Well, how much would I pay to make sure that when I'm playing every one of the treble strings, there's no false beating? Uh, or I'm not having to get a tuner twice a year instead of once a year. How much would I pay for that? Well, maybe another 500 or 1,000. And you, you go through that whole exercise and you realize that you're actually not that far away from what a brand new one would be with a warranty. So this is not a whole lecture to say that new is always better. What I'm saying is there are specific situations in which used is going to make a lot of sense. And that's where the priority is on bass tone clarity, which I find for the dollar does tend to be better with a used piano. Um, and then overall dynamic range, even though a larger piano might have degraded a bit, is still probably going to give you more volume than a brand new smaller one. Um, but where you never really get more value on a used piano is if you're looking for action and touch accuracy, uh, tuning stability, uh, or of course, um, uh, clarity of tone really from about the mid-range uh, up. So that is the third question that I would implore you to explore as we're talking about uh, instruments. Uh, and just once again to reiterate, size, price range, and now we've addressed new versus used. So after those three questions have been explored, then is when I tell customers is a great time to start thinking about brand. Uh, so you know whether you're talking about a specific price range, you know what sort of quality points you're interested, you know the size you can fit, and you know whether uh, new versus used is really where you want to go. Uh, when you start to get into brand is when you can get to know very specific models, uh, and really most uh, companies have specific traits about them that you may enjoy. 
and these are far less objective. Uh, this is something that you might just sit down at some of these instruments and just love it and you may not be able to explain why and you shouldn't be forced to have to uh, think about or you know articulate sometimes why you fall in love with an instrument. This is a, a very emotional and a very uh, personal connection that you have with um, you know a machine or a work of art or kind of halfway between those two things. It's going to allow you to uh, just find a different dimension of relaxation and expression and I mean it's it's wonderful. I you know the the connections that I have with the instruments in my life uh, are precious to me and I really even thinking about parting with them is is uh, causes some anxiety. So you want to find that connection and the point is you don't always have to ha be able to explain it to anyone except yourself. Uh, but getting back to brand um, Different brands will have different characters and this is really now where you're all the way at the bottom of your uh, kind of research and you're drilling finally into the last little uh, nuances and minutia of what you're going to find in these instruments you might really love. Uh, people talk about the Kawhi Yamaha differences, you know, being a little bit warmer, a little bit brighter. Uh, people talk about, uh, you know, the Beckstein versus the Steinway uh, difference and, you know, Beckstein uh, maybe uh, being a little more uh, precise or a little more uh, clear uh, throughout the range, but the Steinway being really growly and, uh, and you know, highly dynamic. Uh, there's all of these comparisons that you'll find, uh, you know, good information on and lots of ongoing debates on the forums and in different websites and in different books. Uh, and you can do all the reading you want on that, but nothing is going to beat uh, being able to just get into a showroom and actually try these instruments yourself so you can finally hone in on those final uh, little details that's going to make this just one of the most exciting uh, and satisfying purchases uh, that hopefully you will ever make. I hope you found the video to be uh, useful. Um, we encourage you to leave comments and questions. We try our best uh, to respond to as many of those as possible. And if you are in the Toronto area, we would love you to stop by either one of our showrooms and just say hi. You know, talk to us about the videos, talk to us about your piano, or if you happen to be in the market for a piano, of course, you know, drop in as well, and we'd be happy to show you uh, what we've got. So the very best of luck to you and your family on this exciting journey. Owning a baby grand uh, or a grand piano is one of the most rewarding um, uh, uh, possessions or instruments or, or things that we can have in our life. Uh, it can last for decades. Uh, it's sort of our artistic partner in crime. So thank you so much for watching. Hopefully we will see you back for more videos again shortly. And if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, we would really, really appreciate if you did. It'll let you stay up to date every time we bring out a new video. Uh, and we're always trying to post content that our subscribers uh, or we think that our subscribers will love. So take care, we'll see you back soon. My name is Stu Harrison and you've been watching Miriam Pianos on YouTube.